I'm Inan Gardi, and I'm a lecturer in theoretical particle physics here at the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to talk today about quantum field theory and specifically about quantum electrodynamics. From the beginning of our studies of classical mechanics, we are used to the idea that the, there is a fixed number of particles in the system and that number fixes the number of degrees of freedom. So if you have one particle, there is one coordinate that you need to solve for the equation of motion. If you have two particles, then you need to solve for the coordinates of these two particles. This number, two in this case, is fixed once and for all. It is precisely this idea that this number is fixed that we have to abandon when we go to study quantum field theory. The basic reason for that is that pair creation in quantum field theory is part of what happens. For example, if we start with one particle, at some later moment in time, we may end up with three because a pair has been created. I would like to explain on general grounds why it is the case that in a relativistic quantum theory we cannot assume that the number of particles is fixed in advance. Let us take for example the case of a single particle in a box. Let the box be of length L and we have a single relativistic particle inside. Now, based on the uncertainty principle, we know that there is some uncertainty in the moment, momentum which is connected with the accuracy at which we want to localize the particle in position. And that has to be larger than a number of order h bar. Since we have localized the particle in position to the extent that we know the length L, then delta P must be larger than h bar over L. Because this is a relativistic particle, we also have uncertainty in the energy, which is similarly c h bar over L. Now let us think about the mass of this particle. Particle has mass m, and therefore rest energy m c squared. That's the energy. Now, if we make the box small enough, then the uncertainty in the energy would start to be bigger than the energy itself. And then we will be able to accommodate more than one such particle within the range of uncertainty. For this reason, we cannot claim that the particle was a single particle all the way through. A pair can be created and would violate this assumption. We therefore need a framework in which the description of a varying number of particles is possible, and that's quantum field theory. So, when we describe a particle in a relativistic quantum theory, we actually don't want to describe an isolated particle, but rather, the physical picture is that there is a particle surrounded by a cloud of other particles. These pop out of the vacuum and then annihilate back again. So the number of particles is not fixed. And it is this scenario that quantum field theory allows us to describe. Thinking about the previous lectures, the easiest example in which we can approach quantum field theory is that of electromagnetism. Classically, we have the picture that the electric and magnetic field obey Maxwell's equations. But we also have evidence that electromagnetism gives rise to particles. We know that photons are particles of light, as we have seen looking at a photoelectric effect. In quantum field theory, both the wavy and the particle aspects of electromagnetism 
appear simultaneously. And this is very natural. The fields obey Maxwell's equation classically, and once we quantize them, we get photons, which are the quantum mechanical excitation of the same field. So let us return to classical electromagnetism and then compare to what we have in quantum field theory. So in classical electromagnetism, if we have a charge here, E, it creates a field. The field gets smaller the further away we go. And then we can probe it by putting another charge here. And it will be a repulsion force due to the field on this other charge. How do we describe the same interaction in quantum field theory? We will describe it by the exchange of photons. The photons are the particles that represent the quantized version of this field. This particle emits a photon, and that photon is absorbed in this electron here, and in this way they interact. We therefore regard the photon as the force carrier of the electromagnetic field. So let us now think about the electrons themselves that provide the source for this radiation. In quantum field theory, we also introduce a field for the electrons. So now we have one field A for the photons, another field Psi for the electrons, and that is the content of quantum electrodynamics QED, which is the theory that I'm going to describe in the remaining of this lecture. Fundamentally, the description of the electron and the photon is the same. They are both described by a field. In fact, the way to think about this field is the following. If we have two electrons, they are excitations of the same field. In fact, if we have an electron that we produce now in the lab, and we compare its properties to electron that was produced, say, in the beginning of the universe, far away, these two electrons have exactly the same properties. In quantum field theory, this is very natural, because these are excitations of the very same field Psi. So they must be the same. If we think about it without quantum field theory, this would be a mystery. Why are the two electrons exactly the same? Quantum field theory provides a natural answer to this question. So while the electron and the photon are both described by fields, when we look at the details, these fields behave quite differently. For example, we know that the photon is described by Maxwell's equations. More precisely, there is a wave equation that follows from Maxwell's equation, and that excitation is the photon. That equation corresponds to a particle of spin 1. When we think about the electron, we know that the properties are different. It is described by the Dirac equation, and that corresponds to a spin 1 half. This is related to the fact that while photons can be in the same quantum state, any number of them, with electrons, only a single electron can occupy a particular quantum state. The best example of that is when we construct the energy levels of an atom. Only one electron can occupy a given quantum state, and as a result, atoms have energy levels that fill in up to a certain level following Pauli's exclusion principle. It is only the outer layer of this atom that determines the chemical properties giving rise to all the rich chemistry that we are familiar with. So the fact that electrons are spin one-half particles described by the Dirac equation is very important for the world as we know it. Particles of spin 1, or integer spin, are called bosons, whereas particles of spin 1 half 
are called fermions. When we look at the amplitude, in the case of two identical bosons, it obeys a symmetric relation, namely m of 1 and 2, where these are two identical bosons, equals m of 2 and 1. Whereas for fermions, m of 1 and 2 equals minus m of 2 and 1. This property is a generalization of Pauli's exclusion principle, and that's the way quantum field theory gets this distinction between bosons and fermions. In the following lectures, we'll see more examples of matter particles, as well as more examples of force carriers, such as the photon. And it so happens that in nature, the matter are all of this fermion type, whereas the force carriers are all of this boson. So let us describe quantum electrodynamics. That's the theory that describes the interactions of a photon, electron, and its antiparticle, the positron. The easiest way to introduce this theory is to introduce the Feynman rules, which are the basic things that can happen. There are just three things that can happen. A photon can propagate from one point x to another point y, this propagation would depend on the invariant distance between these two points, x minus y squared. This is the Lorentz invariant distance between the two points. Similarly, an electron can propagate between some point w and a point z. For electrons, the notation is a straight line rather than a wavy line. A positron, according to the Dirac equation, is described as an electron that goes backwards in time. And because of that, the notation is like this. The arrow goes in the opposite way. So time flows from here to there, and the arrow is reversed. That's the positron. So far, we only described the propagation of these particles, namely, they are moving from one point in space-time to another. The interesting bit is when they actually interact. And in quantum electrodynamics, there is only one type of interaction. That is, an electron moves and then emits a photon at some point in space-time. So this is the electron coming in. That's the electron getting out, and this is the photon here. And this here is the local interaction vertex where the photon is emitted by the electron. It has to be emphasized that the same vertex can be understood differently as, for example, a photon that becomes a pair of electron and positron. Or, alternatively, the annihilation of an electron and a positron at this point into a photon. All of these are described by the same type of interaction vertex, and that's the only interaction in quantum electrodynamics. An important property of the Feynman rules of quantum electrodynamics that we have just described is charge conservation. Let's take the interaction vertex. We had an electron emitting a photon and continuing here in its trajectory. What we see is that there is precisely one electron coming in and one electron going out. The charge overall in this vertex is locally conserved. Similarly, if we had a more complex process into which one electron comes in, 
then we can imagine that also one electron will come out conserving the total charge. Of course it is allowed that photons will also come out because they carry no charge, so this is all consistent. Also pairs of electrons and positrons can get out together such that the total charge is still minus one in electron units as it was. But what can never happen is that three electrons will come out out of one electron. Since this is locally forbidden, it is also globally forbidden and we will never have such violation of charge. Charge conservation is so fundamental to the construction of quantum electrodynamics, in fact, it is the, related to the symmetry by which we construct quantum electrodynamics. In the following, we will not return to this symmetry principle, but instead will go through simple processes and try to understand the physics that quantum electrodynamics implies in these processes. Let us describe the simplest process that we can construct in quantum electrodynamics. That's the scattering of an electron on a positron. So the initial state is an electron and a positron. You can think about time in these diagrams always moving to the right. And what we can imagine here is that we can exchange a photon between the two and then this photon is emitted from the electron and absorbed in the positron in this way. Here we have a detector and a detector sees this electron, sees this positron, measures their energy, measure their momentum, and in this way we know what happened. Now we return to the Feynman rules and compute the probability that this process will take place. This probability will involve the propagation of the photon from this point to that point, it will involve the fact that in each vertex we have to remember the charge E that comes with this interaction vertex. And then we'll have to sum over all possible positions of these vertices. Instead of summing over all possible positions of the vertices, we can take a Fourier transform and think about this process in momentum space. We then assign particular momenta to the incoming particle, P1, and P2 to the positron. And similarly, let's call it P3 and P4 for the outgoing particles. And then instead of summing over all possible positions of these vertices, we can sum over all possible momenta. But now, we see that the momentum of this particle here is actually constrained to be the difference between this momentum here and that momentum there. So if k is going downwards, k must be equal to p1 minus p3. Similarly, in this vertex, momentum conservation would imply that k, the same k here, equals p4 minus p2. Let's look at what we obtained. What we obtained is a relation between the incoming momentum, p1 plus p2, equals p3 plus p4. And the statement is that the total energy and momentum coming in is the same as the total energy and momentum getting out. So in quantum mechanics, everything that can happen will happen. In particular, when we scatter an electron on a positron, this is not the only thing that can happen. 
For example, we can also have the electron and the positron annihilate each other in this way by the interaction vertex, produce a photon which then decays again into an electron and a positron. When you look at these two processes, they look very different. Here, the electron that we started with is the same electron that the detector finds. Here, the initial electron we started with annihilates. That's the end of its life. Here, the detector sees the new electron that emerged at this very point out of the vacuum. However, as always in quantum mechanics, we will not be able to distinguish between these two processes. What we have to do is add them up to get the amplitude. It's the sum of these two that can be detected. What we want to compute is eventually the probability that such a process will happen. The probability is proportional to the amplitude square. And clearly, this is not the same as squaring the first diagram, which we call D1, plus the second diagram, which we call D2. This is not the same thing. If we were to do that, we would miss an important contribution, which is the interference between these two ways of the process to take place. So in fact, when we see in our detector the electron here and the positron there, it is neither this that happened, nor that, nor the interference. It is the contribution of all of these together. So, so far we have seen that the process that we are interested in, the scattering of electron and positron, can happen in two different ways. We have the scattering channel, like this, and the annihilation channel, like that. But this is not the only things that can happen. We can use the Feynman rules that we learned earlier and introduce more interaction vertices. For example, it is possible that this photon here, before it created the final electron-positron pair, actually created a pair that then annihilated back, like this. This is definitely allowed by the rules that we introduced, and anything that can happen will happen including that. Similarly here, we can also have a bubble of this form. What I said earlier is that we'll have to sum over everything that can happen, and these are included. Let us now think about momentum conservation in the context of diagrams like that, that include a loop. Here we had momentum P1 and P2, this was k, the sum of them. Here, we will not be able to determine the momenta of these two particles that are created based on the momenta of the external particles. Instead, if this is q, then all we can say is that this one is k minus q. And we don't know what this q is based on momentum conservation. Momentum conservation in this vertex will just tell us that here it's k again. So what we deduce is that every time we have a loop, we actually have to sum over all possible values of this loop momentum. We have to perform an integral over this q, including the energy and the free spatial component of the momentum. 